Hi, my name is Mara Benjamin. I'm the curator of the Erlen Lee Museum Home in Stone Creek, Ontario. Um, we are situated right on the Niagara Escarpment overlooking Lower Stony Creek and Lake Ontario below. So it's a really, really beautiful site. Um, the name is a little long though, so we generally call it the Lee. So if you hear me calling um, the Lee in this presentation, I'm referring to the museum, not necessarily the family that lived on the site. I'd like to thank the Goldberg Museum for inviting me to speak this evening. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for, for uh, thinking of me. Um, I'd also like to thank Irene Robillard and Linda Mitchell, who have been instrumental uh, leaders in the FWIO Tweedsmere Digitization Project, which we'll talk about a little bit later in this presentation. So today's lecture, entitled One Tweedsmere at a Time, How the Women's Institute Preserves Community Histories, uh, we're going to talk about what is the Women's Institute, what is a Tweedsmere community history book, we're going to look at a couple examples of Tweedsmere community history books, and then we're going to look towards what does the future of historical preservation by the Women's Institute look like. So we're going to start by talking about what is the Women's Institute. Well, the Women's Institute, often referred to as the WI, is an organization focused on empowering, educating, and supporting women in their communities. And these pillars are represented through the organization's motto for home and country. The Women's Institute was started way back in 1897. It began when Erland Lee, invited Adelaide Hunter Hoodless to speak at the February 12th, 1897 Ladies' Night Meeting of the South Wentworth Farmers Institute, of which he was the secretary treasurer. Uh, Erland had heard about this amazing woman, Adelaide, who was going around and speaking about the importance of female empowerment, female education, particularly education in the domestic sciences. Uh, and he thought she would be just the perfect person to come and speak to this group of rural women at Squires Hall. Erland and his wife Janet Chisholm Lee were both in attendance at this meeting and they were absolutely inspired by what Adelaide had said and they felt that this message needed to be received by a larger group of women. So they went around in their community, they got on their cutter sled in the middle of February 1897 on the escarpment, which if you're not from around here it snows a lot in February on the escarpment, um, and they hand-delivered invitations to every woman they could find in their community. And a week later, on February 19th, 1897, over 100 individuals packed into Squires Hall to hear Adelaide speak, specifically to hear her speak about the formation of a women's institute modeled after the Farmers Institute. So a small group of the people who were in attendance at this second meeting with Adelaide they came back to Edgemont, which was the Lee family farm, now the Erlen Lee Museum home, or the Lee. Um, and they sat around the dining room table and they came up with the constitution, which Janet Lee wrote down. Um, so we do still have this original constitution at the museum, safely housed. But we also have copies available for visitors to flip through on tours and to purchase as souvenirs. So you can see in this top left image there, that is a few members of our Erlen Lee Museum Committee looking through one of the visitor copies of the Constitution at the beloved dining room table where the original was written. Now, from the beginning of the Women's Institute, men such as Erlen Lee, F.W. Hodson, F.M. Carpenter, E.D. Smith were all heavily involved in the formation of this group because you have to remember women were not considered persons at this time in history. So in order to found a government sanctioned group, they needed men to do that. So the Women's Institute was originally started as an auxiliary group of the South Wentworth Farmers Institute. F.W. Hodson, who was the superintendent of the South of the Farmers Institutes of Ontario, he wrote an open letter to Erland in March of 1897 stating that he believed the Women's Institute was an amazing organization, um, it had great potential, and it was greatly needed by the women of Ontario. But he urged Erland to keep it quite small and local for the time being um, because F.W. Hodson was in poor health at that time, but he really wanted to be a part of seeing that organization grow. And he did keep his promise by 1919 
the Women's Institute had spread and there was a Federated Women's Institutes of Ontario as well as the Federated Women's Institutes of Canada. And from there, it spread to over 450 um, local and national groups in over 70 countries, and they all operate under the umbrella of the Associated Country Women of the World. So you can see all of their logos there. Um, I work for the Federated Women's Institutes of Ontario. They're the ones that own and operate the Erlen Lee Museum home. And we can see here that their head office is actually located right inside the, uh, the Lee Museum, which is, of course, the birthplace of the Women's Institute. So it's very cool that we get to work so closely with the organization that was founded in the historic home. Um, this is a very, very, very condensed list of some of the things that the Women's Institute has done over the years. Um, as I mentioned, the Women's Institute has always been dedicated to supporting women, but also to supporting their communities. Um, so they do this in a, a variety of ways. Um, they focus on increasing access to education, improving community um, through health and environmental activism, and they lobby political groups for change in communities. Um, and they're generally quite successful. So a couple of their initiatives have been in the 1950s, 60s, and 80s, there were campaigns to ban the advertisement of alcohol and cigarettes on television and radio, particularly so that children wouldn't be exposed to these things. Um, and this kind of movement continued in later decades as the WI lobbied the government to regulate um, the advertisement, consumption, and warnings, and safety surrounding alcohol. Uh, they've also been really involved in agricultural campaigns over the years. One of the main focuses has been ensuring that the government um, provides fair prices for both the producers and consumers of agricultural goods, particularly beef, but also other goods. Um, there was a big push in the 1950s and 60s by the WI to ensure that all babies in Ontario got birth certificates automatically, because this wasn't something that was being done before. Um, the WI was also instrumental in bringing Brock University and having that established in St. Catharines, Ontario. Um, and additionally, the WI continues to work really hard on health and environmental causes. One of their current campaigns is fundraising for Lyme disease research in Canada. So whether you know it or not, whether you know a WI member or not, Every single person in Ontario has been positively impacted by the work of the WI. Um, the WI has worked behind the scenes to do just an immense amount of, of work and activism in our province. So a few examples are if you've ever been driving behind a school bus and it stops and the lights flash and the stop sign comes out and you have to stop behind it so that children can safely cross the street, that was an initiative of the WI. Um, if you drive on those same roads and there are lines down the middle to keep you and the other drivers safe, you can thank the WI. Uh, if you enjoy pasteurized milk with your cookies, again, thank the WI. And one of my personal favorites, if you have ever gone looking for community or genealogical research and you've stumbled upon Tweedsmere's, thank the WI. So that brings us to what exactly is a Tweedsmere? Well, a Tweedsmere Community History Book, as they're officially called, but usually we call them Tweedsmeres, they're basically scrapbooks of a community's history. So most branches create them. All Federated Women's Institutes of Ontario branches are encouraged to do so. Um, and the branches that do, they have a dedicated Tweedsmere coordinator that puts these books together. And as a result, no two books are really the same because each coordinator is going to bring their individual style and ideas to the process. So as we can see in these images, there are very different kinds of tweed smears. So the one on the far right, that's a water bottle for context, that's an absolutely enormous tweed smear. Whereas some of the other ones we have in the collection are fairly small. So as a comparison, something like that very large tweed smear in the image, it could include century a century or more of genealogical or farm history. It could include photos of community events, birth, marriage, and death certificates for significant community members, as well as very detailed descriptions. A lot of these tweet also include biographies of either prominent WI or 
prominent community members. Um, and on the other hand, you might have a smaller tweed smear that includes mostly newspaper clippings or programs from WI anniversary celebrations and very little um, written detail. But despite the differences, even though you're going to get all kinds of different tweed smears with all kinds of different content, every single tweed smear is valuable when we're researching the history of a space and its people. So Tweedsmere's get their name from Lord and Lady Tweedsmere. Lord Tweedsmere was born John Buchan. He was the first Baron Tweedsmere, um, and he was the 15th Governor General of uh, Canada. He served during the term of Prime Minister William Lyon Mackenzie King, and also during the very popular first royal visit to Canada by King George VI and Queen Elizabeth in 1939. Um, he was just about to finish his term in 1940 when he passed away due to a stroke. Um, he was kind of a jack of all trades when it came to education and literacy. So he was not only a lawyer and a foreign diplomat, but he was actually a really well-known novelist. Um, one of his novels entitled 39 Steps was actually turned into a movie by Alfred Hitchcock in 1935. So that's kind of cool. Um, but when he wasn't in his office or writing, he was actually out amongst the Canadian people trying to encourage and instill a sense of national identity and pride that was not hindered by differences of language and religion. His wife, Lady Tweedsmere, uh, her name was actually Susan Buchan. She was even more passionate about education and literacy than her husband. So she is to thank for the creation of the Governor General's Literary Award, which she encouraged her husband to create in 1936. This is actually still the highest award given to a work of literary fiction in Canada. Um, she's also responsible for the Lady Tweedsmere Prairie Library Scheme which was essentially her sending out over 40,000 books from Rideau Hall to Western, Ontario, or Western Canada sorry, um, as an, in an effort to try to encourage literacy and education in the Western provinces and across Canada. So the idea of a Tweedsmere community history book actually got its start a little bit before the Tweedsmeres got involved. So in 1925, something called the Committee for Historical Research and Current Events was created by the Federated Women's Institutes of Ontario, and it was the desire of this group to put more energy and more focus within the FWIO um, to... Um, preserving histories and to recording histories for future generations. And this was a great idea, but it didn't really start to gain, gain traction until Lady Tweedsmere brought it up at a meeting of the Athens Women's Institute, which she became really involved in by 1930. Um, and she really pushed the importance of preserving history and specifically preserving the rural community histories, which were for the most part where WIs were located. They were mostly in rural communities. Um, so she encouraged that her fellow sisters follow suit of what the UK WI was already doing in terms of preserving histories in scrapbooks, and from there it really took off. And by 1940, the books were titled the Tweedsmere Village History Books in honor of the recently departed Lord Tweedsmere. So in 1945, in preparation for the 50th anniversary of the Women's Institute in 1947, the FWIO made this an official campaign. So they encouraged branches to create Tweedsmere's in celebration of the WI's 50th anniversary, and it really took off from there. So in 1940, these books had been officially called, um, well, sorry. They had been officially named the, uh, the Tweedsmere Village History Books in honor of Lord Tweedsmere. And then they changed their name just to Tweedsmere History Books. They changed their name a couple of times, um, but they always retained the name Tweedsmere in honor of Lord Tweedsmere. Um, so Tweedsmere's really took off in Ontario. Branches were really excited about them. And by 1957, the FWIO board had reported that over a thousand branches in the province were creating tweed smears, um, which means there are a lot of them. Uh, so the FWIO hired, or sorry, 
kind of volunteered um, Mrs. R.C. Walker to be the first Tweedsmere coordinator for the province. And she did an absolutely amazing job. Um, Hester Walker not only created provincial Tweedsmere's, but she also taught other Tweedsmere coordinators how to create a Tweedsmere so that there would be some kind of um, regulations around them. So she gave workshops on creating Tweedsmere's and she created the first Tweedsmere manual, which although it's been changed and updated over the years, it's still the backbone of what we use today because WI branches are still creating Tweedsmere's today. Next slide, please. Um, so over the years, Tweedsmere's have been recognized for various awards and accolades as have those who create them. Um, so in 1949, they received a prize from the American Association for State and Local History. And then in 1950, they were included in the Royal Commission on National Development of the Arts, Letters and Sciences by the Honorable Vincent Massey. This is known today as the Massey Commission. And then in 2004, the WI Tweedsmere coordinators were awarded the Scatting Award of Excellence by the Ontario Historical Society. Next slide, please. Um, so, as Annie mentioned, the Goldberg Museum has used Tweedsmere's in the past. These are invaluable resources for learning about the history of a community. Um, so even though I personally don't know that much about the Stittsville WI, I wanted to include a little bit about this branch just to bring it closer to home for those of you that are watching from the area surrounding the Goldberg Museum. So the Stittsville WI started in 18, or sorry, 1908, um, and one of its founding members, Grace Thompson, was the Tweedsmere coordinator for her branch. She was also just incredibly involved in her community, to the point that in 2017, the Stittsville branch of the Ottawa Public Library dedicated a room to her, so we can see the unveiling of her plaque there in that image. Um, and some of the Tweedsmere's that were left behind by the Stittsville WI include Country Tales, Farms and Families, Reflections from a Changing Countryside, and Tweedsmere's Community and Courage. Um, and as Anya mentioned, this branch is no longer in existence, but it was active for over 85 years and they left behind some incredible resources. Next slide, please. So the Tweedsmere's that this branch created, they were published, they're available to anybody, and they're held in various museums, including the Stittsville branch of the Ottawa Public Library, but they're also included at Yale University Reference Library and the Toronto Reference Library. Um, they're heavily referenced by websites such as Stittsville uh, Central, which included these interesting articles I found. Um, but museums reference them, researchers, websites. Tweedsmere's are used by everybody. Next slide. Um, so now we're gonna shift gears to Tweedsmere's that have been digitized as part of the um, FWIO's ongoing Tweedsmere digitization project, which is a bit of a mouthful. Um, but we can see here on the screen kind of what that website looks like. So for the purposes of today's presentation, we're gonna look at a Stony Creek Tweedsmere, um, which is where I am. So you can see this is the virtual archives and you can search for a title at the top there. Um, and then once you find the title you're looking for and you click on it, it'll bring you to the second page. And in order to actually flip through and look at the pages of that book, you select a page at the top left drop down menu we're gonna pick page one, which is the cover page and dive right into that. Next slide, thank you. Um, so I chose this one because in my opinion, this is a perfect example of what a Tweedsmere should look like. Um, although I suppose there is no should because all Tweedsmeres are good Tweedsmeres. Um, this one in particular, it's in the official FWIO Tweedsmere cover. It's got a title page. It's got distinct sections and subsections on the history of the Women's Institute and the history of Stony Creek as a community. Um, and it includes additional information like this um, insert from inside the cover that says, this is book number two. The first history book has been microfilmed. The book was started January 1972, but the yearly summaries of the WI activities date back to 1967. And that's really helpful to know because if I'm looking for information on this branch from 1950, I'm gonna know I wanna go to the microfilms from book one. Next slide, please. 
So this tweets mirror is so well organized. It includes so much detail. Um, and this is really important because tweets mirror coordinators, when they're creating a tweets mirror, they might not really be thinking about the future generations that are going to rely on this book. But the truth is that's who these books are for. The books aren't necessarily for the branches that are creating them. They're for future generations. So as I'm coming up to the 150th anniversary of the Women's Institute next year, as well as the 50th anniversary of the museum, this is one tweet smear that's going to be particularly useful for me. Because as we can see from these excerpts, they've got an entire page taken from the Niagara Peninsula Weekly that talks about the opening of the museum in 1972. And they've also got, this is only one example, but they've got kind of featured biographies on the charter members of the Women's Institute. So here we have lovely Mrs. Van Wagner, um, but it also talks about the Lees, it talks about some of the lesser known members who are charter members, um, and this is going to be really, really helpful for me and anybody else that's creating an online exhibit or programming surrounding these important anniversaries. Next slide, please. So what does the future of preserving histories look like for the Women's Institute? Well, our, our methods have changed a little bit in that we're going digital now. We realize that we live in a digital world and in order to give as many people as possible access to the histories that the WI has preserved, we need to put them online. So this is where the Tweedsmere digitization project comes in. And this project has been graciously funded through the Government of Canada's Documentary Heritage Community Program of the Library and Archives Canada. Um, and this is where people like Linda Mitchell and Irene Robillard and Judy Soden come in. They are volunteers from the WI that have recognized the importance of preserving these pieces of history. Um, and so together with staff and other volunteers, they have collected physical tweezmeers from across Ontario. They've had them scanned, they've returned the books, they've uploaded them to our virtual website, multiple servers, and then they write metadata on these. So they describe the tweet smears. They tell you where they're from, who wrote them, um, so that all of that information is easily accessible on the website when the public is able to go up and enjoy them. Next slide. Um, so just to kind of wrap up what we've learned today, the Women's Institute is organized to empower, educate, and support women, but also to preserve histories through Tweedsmere Community History Books, which are composed by branches to tell the story of a community. And even though our methods may have changed with the times, our mission remains the same for home and country. Thank you.